Welcome back, everyone. I'm Dr. Fushan Zain, and I'm so excited to have Dr. Stephen Gilligan is a psychologist, the developer of generative change work, which includes the applications of generative coaching, generative psychotherapy, generative trans, hero's journey, and systematic change work. He was one of the original NLP and Ericksonian hypo hypnotherapy practitioners. This work unfolded into his original approaches of self-relations and generative self. And then further in collaboration with Robert Diltz into generative coaching. He has taught in many different cultures and countries over the past 30 years and has published extensively. His numerous books include The Hero's Journey, A Voyage of Self-Discovery, which he co-authored with uh, Robert Diltz, and the classic therapeutic trains, The Courage to Love, The Legacy of Erickson, Walking into uh, Two World and Generative Trans, The Experience of Creating Flow. And his fourth, his forthcoming book is Generative Coaching. Welcome to the show. John. Hi, great. Great to be here. It's or not my first time, but it's great to be back. Yes. Yeah. My experience for anyone who uh, wasn't with us the last time is my own experience with you, uh, not only as a human being and a fellow therapist, but also as watching you do work with clients is the utmost level of acceptance and love. Like this love um, exuberates from every cell of your body and takes over the space of your clients or the person who's working with you and even just being around you there's this eminent love and respect and i just want to honor you for that like wow thank you, thank you. well having carefully considered the alternatives <laughs> <laughs> that's true <laughs> so um, I listened to one of your workshops that uh, you had in Evolution of Psychotherapy, um, and um, you talk about transforming the problems that someone experiences into um, a, a solution, but as a resource. And uh, you take the negative emotions that show up and, and in a way honor them, that they are there and they're, uh, they're present. I know that most of us, um, naturally, as a human being, we try to fight it or say that it's not supposed to be there. And um, even as therapists, a lot of times we'll tune in in order to alleviate it, take it away and as soon as possible. And your approach is different. Can you share a little bit with that? Yeah. Well, it's really, you know, my, I've had many great um, teachers and mentors. I always consider Milton Erickson, the great psychiatrist, hypnotherapist, to be my mentor of mentors. And that was really the heart of his approach that he created over 50 years, that what, whatever is in a person's experience, you start with that and you make positive use of that. And this idea that everything has equal capacity to be destructive or constructive, depending on the human connection with it. So when we encounter these significant, intense, negative experiences, we're seeing two things. One is there's some core human pattern there. And it's really important because it insistently you know, keeps asserting itself regardless of the best efforts to try to suppress it or get rid of it. And, you know, we have a saying, if you can't beat them, join them. So we see that at the heart of all these problems are these important core resources. And if we can develop this relationship with it that is positive and curious and kind-hearted and skillful, then that very thing that seemed to be the worst thing in a person's life can actually turn out to be the best thing. Um, there's, a, there's a duality here, which is um, there's a pain or a suffering that the person wants to, um, to let it go. At best, what I've noticed is people try to tolerate it. 
you know, it's not like an accepting it, but the attempt to tolerate yeah. it. And yeah. the, the space you're talking about is very different than tolerating it. Can you share a little bit of that experience of uh, the acceptance and love and the hospitable place that you talk about uh, with being with that emotion or the symptom that shows up? Well, you're using the word duality and really to get into this creative state of transformation, we say it's a non-dual state. And, you know, so we're, we're thinking in the following way. Everything that we know as reality, we're actively constructing. Everything. There's, there's not some independent world out there. We are actively creating it. And this is sort of the convergence of a lot of different traditions and neuroscience and psychology and philosophy. That doesn't mean we're just doing it from our verbal mind or, or primarily as individuals. So it's not that, oh, I have cancer. That means I had, I had negative thoughts. It's, it's much more interesting than that. But consciousness is creating reality through many, many, many different levels. You know, through our ancestors, through the history of consciousness, most of the time, we're not in a truly creative state because we're on automatic. You know, most of the time, the stuff that's being created is just automatic uh, renditions of what has gone before. Okay? So some of those things are outdated. You know, like, uh, you know, my, Milton Erickson used to say, the way that you, uh, you understood love when you were uh, four years old changes maybe when you're 12 and then changes again when you're 20. And then once you're 40 or 50, you better be understanding love in a way different than, than how you did it at four. So, so sometimes these problems develop because we have outdated creative patterns. Sometimes these problems get created because all of these expressions are coming from need, basic human needs. Like we all have a need to be close to other people. And so, you know, you'll see it as a, like a four-year-old to say unconsciously, say, I want to hug my mommy. I want to hug my daddy. And they go and, and say, I need a hug. Or I need to climb up in your lap. If, if the human presence, the parent in that case, says, oh, come here, sweetheart. And, and draws that need into a loving human relationship and connects with it for a while. So that that child can be able to experience and develop ways of understanding how to get that need met then you have a positive resource. Mm -hmm. Let's say you had that same need, that same four-year-old and says, I need a hug and goes to climb up on the lap and gets pushed off or the parents are caught in depression or anger or they you know, got their own stuff and they push the kid away and get cold. That human connection, that negative human connection is what gets wrapped around this core resource of I, I need warmth and, and human connection. And that becomes its representation. And so I, now I have this sense in my, my body and mind, uh, I, asking people for intimacy is bad. I don't deserve it. I can't get it. If I ask people for it, something terrible will happen. So now that need doesn't go away because it's just vital to every, every human being. It goes underground and it starts being expressed in non-human ways. I can't get it through human connection. I'll get it through non-human connection. Maybe that means drugs or maybe alcohol or maybe I get addicted to the uh, internet or you know, maybe I just while away in depression. So what we see at the heart of those symptoms is that their core basic human needs 
that will continue to assert themselves all through your life. So you can't get rid of them. I'm also hearing based on what you're saying is that as the human need shows up and then because it was unfulfilled, then there's another set of, um, let's say, strategies, uh, coping yeah. mechanisms as, uh, right. you know, as it comes in. Um, do you sense that, that every time the need shows up, because this way of mechanism is also associated with it, that they all show up at the same time consistently? Or is there a separate, a separate space also between the original need and the coping mechanism? Well, the coping mechanism, I think, what, and we, we can see this so clearly, is that when a person goes into the negative version of that experience, I, I want warmth, I, I need a hug, uh, uh oh, I can't get it, they go into what we call neuromuscular lock, that there's a shutdown in the system. And that takes the experience away from the present moment, it takes it away from. Um, present consciousness. And now it's going to act out without sensitivity, without human connection. And so you get what Freud called the repetition compulsion. So that that negative state is becomes sort of quasi independent. And then it activates this sense that you learned from the outside, this part of me is bad. This part of me has no place in the world. And so if I want to, if, if I want to express love for my family, if I want to be a good person, if I want to be accepted by the social community, I have to really try to get rid of that quote unquote bad part of me. Mm -hmm. So what we're looking to do is any attempt to, to try to change it is like throwing gasoline on the fire. Think of it as a young child or a, a puppy or a cat or a horse. When, if you in any way are negative or uh, upset uh, to any of those vulnerable mammals is that they will, they will contract further. So what I learned from Erickson is the first step to transforming or healing or changing is to stop trying to change it. This isn't then something you're doing up in your head. This is where we have to cultivate the, the state underneath dualism. But before the world gets good versus bad, there's a place, you know, uh, one of the great lines in one of the Rumi poems is, there is a field beyond right doing and wrong doing, I'll meet you there. Yeah. So there's a place before good versus bad, before this dualism, that's where we do the work from. And that's where the generative con concept con shows up. Where that's, that's the space where it, gener it can generate from versus everything else goes into a habitual space. That's right. So that's the first platform. It, it's, it's necessary, but it's not sufficient. So you got to get there and people think, wow, how am I going to do that? Well, that's what we look at practically. When do you feel most connected in your life? Because everybody's got something, you know? So we ask these practical questions, uh, Hey, when you really need to make a good connection with yourself, you know, you've been working 40 days and 40 nights. I think I need to get back home to me. What do you do? And they're, they're usually simple things that don't cost, most of them cost no money. You know, I go for a walk. Uh, I go sit at the beach. I garden. I cook. I read books. Uh, I play with my pets you know, the usual suspects. Well, now we look at when you go into those special states, the states that really work for you, your special places, does your, does your verbal mind that's trying to control the world one relationship at a time, does it increase or decrease? You know, people say, oh, I, I start calming down. 
are you more or less in control? Well, that's a funny question because I'm not thinking in terms of control. I mean, I, I'm in control, but I don't feel like I have to control. And then finally, in those states, when you're gardening, when you're listening to music, when you're, for me, it's like reading books is, is one of my main ways to get there. Is that where does your sense of self end? And people all act like they're Italian. <laughs> they start talking with their hands. So this is the starting point. But most of the time we think, oh, I can only get that under optimal conditions, which for a lot of people means there's nobody around. When I'm in these ideal conditions, then I can let down my guard and get into that open, open presencing state. So what we're doing is saying, no, you, it also is very crucial for any transformation, any healing, uh, any time you're in a place where you feel I want to create further in my life. That's the starting point. So the space of um, coming, to, coming to a space, as I hear you, where you are fully connected with you first, right? So sorry, you're, sorry? You're connected with yourself first, right? And so then first the get connected. And then that connection also begins connecting with the, the world yes. beyond you. Yes, which is you. Which is you. Yeah. And then from there, there is a space of generative uh, creativeness where you visualize or you, um, you conceptualize what is the next thing of, of moving toward. Is that what I'm hearing? Or what, what is it that you want to invite into that resilient, safe space mm -hmm. that you want to be able to, to work creatively with? So it could be a, an, an old negative emotion, it could be a negative habit, it could be a positive goal that you're struggling to fulfill, it could be, I, you know, I was working with somebody the other day and her goal was, I, I really want to improve my, uh, my intimacy in my marriage. You know, so what, what positive reality do you want to create? And this is the first level for creativity. You know, so, and, and what we're doing is tracking because it, it's what it, you have to get there first before you ask yourself to do anything challenging. Again, look, look at athletes, look at creative performers. This is what they do. Now, before you ask yourself to do a challenging performance, remember all the training that you've done to get yourself into a positive performance state. Okay. Then you have to track it every moment. You know, if you're working with somebody, you could see with a a lot of times you can get there away from the problem. So you say, okay, let, you, there, that's the problem. Tell me about some really positive parts of your life. Oh, I love cooking. You know, what, what do you do? What, what's your favorite thing to cook? What do you like about it? What are the smells? What are the, the dishes you like to make? Breathe that through. That allows you to get that positive state. But as soon as you say, so let's come back to the problem. You're really noticing carefully because oftentimes that's where they, they start to lose that state again. And so getting people to recognize, I need, I need to get into this positive state and I need to track it because it's really easy to lose it. So if you can do those two things, whatever methods that you have, and most people have methods, they're just not working. You know, that they've got, they've got some decent technical methods, but the problem is they're not able to stay fully present and connected to their creativity as they go through the method. One of the things that shows up for me, um, 
as you were talking, this showed up. I, um, let's say, challenge uh, this concept of um, what do I eat that is not good for me and yet it's tasty. And I've, you know, I've had a background of abuse, so I disconnected from my body for many, many years. Yeah. So then it was okay, then let's connect. And then part of the beauty of connection had to do with food and taste. So that would be one way of connecting with my body. Yeah. And then obviously it still had the construct of, um, okay, well, any anything for me that is tasty, it's also fine and doesn't work for my body. So then it was this, um, this challenge of constantly, you know, gaining 25 pounds and losing and gaining and losing. And it was okay, you know, kind of moderating it. And as you were talking, and I brought that into like experiencing my own world as you were talking and see how it fits for me. And it showed up for me as if when I go into, oh, I want to take care of my body, I go into the taste part versus the whole part. Yeah. As if I'm not, I'm not asking all of my body, what is it that I want? I only ask what the pleasure of taste that goes into connection. And therefore I'm, I'm creating, yeah. a, you know, um, the duality again versus coming from where you were talking about. Can you share what comes up for you as I share this for you? Yeah, I, I think you're, you've just described that process very well of these uh, unconscious negative habits. So, you know, we all have needs, as I started to say, you know, and all of our creativity is organized around our needs. And, you know, the basic needs like sleep and food and connection and rest and, you know, uh, curiosity. There's relational needs that we have um, to, to belong to uh, a, a family or a group or, you know, to have friends. There are, you know, what Maslow called these self-actualizing needs that are unique to humans. I, I, I want, I, ha I have a creative uh, interest in being able to, to bring something into the world in a new way. So I, I started to say the positive way that we learn to express and experience those needs is they unconsciously pop out into human relationship. The people in that relationship, when we're younger, that's our family, see them, they reflect them back in positive ways. They create a holding place. So we get blessing for them. And then we get supported in how to be able to express them uh, in positive human ways. But if you, if you say, well, my body needs, you know, to, to be seen and recognized, but instead you go through, which I'm, I'm sorry to hear, uh, Fujian, that there was some abuse there. Then your body, particularly at a young age, locks down. It, it's disconnected from your social cognitive, your, your sort of your avatar or your politician, I say, that, that walks around in the world. And it still says, I need connection. So you learn food is my best bet to satisfy this need for connection. And it's automatic, it's automatic. So what we're doing with the coach state, this, that first state of a positive well-being, is we're grounding. Coach, we use, use that term coach because it's an acronym. We get centered, open, sort of slow down and feel the flow of awareness. We feel positive connection to our, our core, our attention, and all the resources, the people and places and beings that really love us and want us to be happy. Okay? And then we're hospitable, we welcome whatever's there. Okay? So you say, well, something's happening when I go to connect with my body where I'm automatically doing all this addictive food behavior. I probably tried to change it. You know, stop eating junk food or whatever it, it might be. And, I, and, and it hasn't worked. So 
plan B is let's let's open a place where we can welcome that part of us that's doing that, listen to it, honor it, and invite it to be able to satisfy that same need in a number of different ways. I use that to stop drinking alcohol. And you think, okay, well, that's nice. But, you know, my, my ancestors are from Ireland. You know, for, for an Irish person to stop drinking alcohol, it's a miracle. <laughs> and my father was a, a violent, fall-down alcoholic. His father, my grandpa, Irish grandfather, I was sure because I had my professional life and I never drank when I was working that I had no problem with alcohol. I, I just drank at dinner two glasses of California Chardonnay. And I went through a very painful divorce after a 20-year marriage. And I started drinking three glasses. I realized at some point I, will, I have a problem. I told myself, stop drinking alcohol. And we got what we call Irish finger signals. So I said, okay, this behavior is coming from somewhere. I don't really understand it, but I'm sure it makes sense. So let's take the time to go into this, what we call a coach day. Then let's get the negative behavior. In this case, it was drinking alcohol and make what we call a somatic model. Let's take away all the words because the words are so judgmental and they bias things. Just strip away all the words and say, represent it like a simple body movement, which be something like this, right? Now what we want to do is slow things down and go through that with rhythm, repetition, and resonance. Those are kind of the three characteristics for making something generative. So I want to understand what it is my inner being is trying to create when I'm doing this, right? So I'm not going to do it quite as slow as I did it, but just so I could smell, I could smell it. This was 15, 16 years ago. I could still smell the cold Chardonnay. I could feel the glass. I feel it coming up. And when it gets to about right here, it's like these little beans inside say, oh boy, alcohol, yay! <laughs> and so just sort of witnessing that, and I could feel as they, this is in my imagination, when the alcohol hits my tongue and it hits the back of my throat there's this warm beautiful feeling uh, which i think is there in most addiction i feel you were talking about non-duality i feel this this oneness warmth of total surrender and and i i can hear my voice say i would do anything for this so that's what we call the positive intention. You know, and rather than saying, well, stop doing it, or it's not rational, or you don't have to do that. We can't change it from here. It's coming from a, a deeper language. But if we create a safe place and allow it to just have rhythm, resonance, and repetition, and then bring this sense of, I'm sure this makes sense, my inner self is trying to create something positive. Let me appreciate it, acknowledge it, welcome it, and then invite it to begin to develop new ways to do that, that in Milton Erickson's words, fit the needs of the present self. You know, so maybe when I was six, 16, 17, that was the best way that I could achieve that warmth, you know. But a lot has happened since then. So now we get to update and say, I have this need, what the alcohol, what the problem, what the symptom has taught me is that I have this non-negotiable need to feel warmth and surrender. And if I don't every day find ways to, to, to satisfy that need, the alcohol will always be there. You know, that's why I tell people, 
your addiction will always be there. You know, use it as a teacher. See what it gave you. Recognize the damage that you had to go through because in order to be in that addiction, you had to defile yourself. You, you, you had to dehumanize yourself. You, know, you, you can see when people are in addiction, the shame or you know, the damage where you realize that you have, have really damaged everything and everybody that is dear to you. But you were willing to do that at that core level because the need was so meaningful. So let's, let's invite the need. Let's create a safe place. Sense what the need is and then ask your creative mind to generate new ways to be able to get that, in this case, that feeling of spiritual surrender, spiritual warmth. And I, I, haven't, I haven't drank uh, since, since that day, knocking on wood, you know. As you were talking, it dawned on me that uh, as I've worked, you know, with addiction for 30 years with myself and others, um, that actually my clients started uh, getting better when I accepted that it's okay for them to be addicts for the rest of their life. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Like as a therapist, when I actually accept it, it's okay. <laughs> And yeah, then, well, you know, that well, obviously went toward them. And then, you know, they, uh, from somewhere else, uh, not from a fighting of, I can't do this, but from somewhere else, it began like, okay, I just, this is not, no longer works for me. But that's exactly what it happened when yeah, I. Yeah, that, that's that. right. So, so, you know, all these core words like love or acceptance or trust or boundaries, they have 10,000 different meanings. And, and as we go through our life, we, we have to keep realizing the meaning I had yesterday may not be the best meaning for me today. Yes. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the upcoming um, uh, seminars and workshop that you have? It's going to be about generative coaching, right? With uh, Robert Diltz? Yeah. So, well, um, I do. Uh, I always have many workshops upcoming stephengilligan.com, uh, check it out. But the one that I'm doing with Robert, which is a virtual conference, is uh, February 11th. February 11th through 14th. We have done, Robert Diltz and I were students together at the University of California at Santa Cruz. That's where I did my undergraduate work. We were in the very first NLP groups uh, I went to Stanford for, for graduate school. I had a sharp break uh, from the NLP world. Robert continued on to become one of the luminaries. After about 20 years, actually uh, 25 years ago, I, I, I know it because our, our kids were young. And so I, I can date it from how old my daughter was. She's 28 now. Um, so we reconnected and we started doing this joint teaching and that evolved into this uh, joint work that we call generative coaching, which is how to coach creativity for individuals and groups and businesses. And we have this 15 day certification program. Um, and this four day virtual course is the first module. It's a standalone but it's really exploring what is it to be able to train yourself to be creative in every context of your life. Um, generative, generative coaching, everyone. Generative coaching 2021 with uh, Steve Gilligan and Robert Diltz. Online workshop February 11th to 14th. That's 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. Pacific. The four, Pacific. Yeah, four, four day. And you can find it at stevegilligan.com. Uh, Stephen. Huh? Stephen with a P. Stephen. Stephen. That's D-E-P-H-E-N. We'll put it uh, under your uh, name here so people yeah. can have that. Yeah. Um, and I can tell everyone, you will love it. I mean, I've learned from you so much every time I've watched your work that I'm sure that anyone who has not been, I'm sure the ones who come have, have experienced you, they're going to constantly come back. But 
uh, the, the ones who have not ex uh, experienced your work, that it would be amazing. And Robert, I mean, I've, I've watched Robert Diltz and he's also amazing. Anything um, in one minute, anything we haven't shared that we really, really want everybody to know? Um, just that this is a practical work that is available to everybody. You know, there are certain places for each of us that sometimes we need a little help from our friends. You know, if we, we can't stay in our positive connection, but basically we're saying everybody's life is a creative journey. And what the work is looking to do is help people find the tools and find the connections so that every day when you wake up, you think this is gonna be a great day. And at the end of every day, <laughs> That was really interesting. I didn't predict 95% of that stuff, but what a great day. Let's get some rest, do it again. So that's, I think, especially now at these times, because we live in, you know, I'm, I just turned 66. I've, I've never had a year like this last year. I mean, I've never been in a year with the Walden. I was in San Francisco in the 60s and so we need these technologies, these communities for deep creative change. That's what the work is looking to do. We hope that you can join us. Absolutely. So everyone, uh, please uh, join Dr. Gilligan in generative coaching uh, with Dr. Gilligan and Robert Dilt, February 11 to 14. Please go to um, Stephen, S-T-E-P-H-E-N, Gilligan.com to get that. Thank you so much again for so much. joining me. And um, I've, again, I always learn from you. And I kind of like bathe in this amazing experience of love and acceptance from you all the time. So thank you. Thank you for taking your time in this busy time that I know you have to be with us. And uh, can, I, can I end with a Rumi poem? Please. The here, the, these are all the Coleman Barks versions. The breezes at dawn have secrets to tell you, don't go back to sleep. You must ask for what you really want. Don't go back to sleep. All night long, people are walking back and forth across the threshold where the two worlds meet. The door is round and open. Don't go back to sleep. Don't go back to sleep. Keep waking up, folks. We need it. Thank you. For everyone, create an amazing life for yourself and everyone around you. And until next week, bye-bye. Hello, I'm Dr. Fujian Zane, and I'm a psychotherapist and a life coach. If you are experiencing anxiety, depression, loneliness, isolation, fear, fear of what's going on with all that's going on in the globe with the coronavirus, what's going to happen to you if you've lost your job and you have a lot of anxiety and you don't know what's going to happen to you and your family, if your kids are at home and you're not used to it and you have no idea how to handle them, if you're working from home and all the structures have changed and you don't really know how to concentrate and restructure and motivate yourself, I'm here for you. Call me and let's have online therapy for anyone who's in California and online coaching for anyone who's in the world. Go to my website, fujan.com, F-O-O-J-A-N.com, and let me be a support to you through online therapy and coaching. I'll be looking forward to hearing from you and being a support to you.